Hi everybody, welcome back to Las Vegas. This is Dave Vellante and you're watching theCUBE. Lisa Martin and Rebecca Knight are also in the house, but right now we have Daniel Denez, the founder of UiPath, CUBE alum. Great to see you again. Thanks so much for coming back in theCUBE. Yeah, it's always exciting to be here with you, Dave. Yeah, right after the keynote uh, this morning. I liked your style. It was very interesting the way you stood up, you started telling stories, you went back to the beginning, um, you, you stressed humility. Why is that important to you to convey to large audience, you know, three, four thousand people here, that, that being humble is, is fundamental to you, but why is that important to convey? Well, I'm not saying we are humble, but I, what I am saying is that I realize that you need to think in terms of humility in your decision-making process, in approaching people, in listening to people, and it's more like a framework to me. Humility gives you a direction. And why it's important? Because I think like most people, I, I was not born with humility at all. In my 30s, actually, I was pretty arrogant <laughs> and unhappy. And I've seen uh, actually how our competitors lost in uh, front of us a very small company because they were kind of arrogant with customers. And customers in the end said, okay, let's work with the other guys that are not. They are more flexible, open, and they do, they listen to us. So this is how I realized this is a big tenet of our culture. And actually it's an interesting story. We, I and the other co-founders, we were talking quite a lot. How can we define our culture? And we went through different propositions. So, like we like to be open, we like to have joy working together, and we are can we have candor. But in the end, I, I had this epiphany. I have to define it by one single word. I need to simplify. And then it came humility to me. But it's more in opposition to be arrogant. It's, it's the capacity of listening to other capacity of changing your mind, be flexible, move fast, understand what's in front of you, make decision fast, change decision fast. So it gave us really a very good framework. And it allows you to attract people like-minded. And being bold is part of that framework. Yes. Uh, so it's not humility and, t t and t t timidity, it's humility, but make decisions fast, be bold, take risks. Yeah, I think actually they go very well hand in hand. And uh, because many people associate humility with being submissive. But on the contrary, humility, it's a trait that gives you clarity and gives you a lot more information that you can use in a bold way. So I think that's actually the best combo. So I heard another story in your keynote, which I never knew, and it blew me away. And I tweeted this out, it's a story of your start, you were in Singapore, and you rightly said on stage, when you do business in Japan, you got to be face to face. Now, <clears throat> I know from experience, it usually takes five or six, sometimes more, face to face meetings in Japan before they even begin to trust you and give you an opportunity. But you decided to reroute to, to, to Japan, and actually the, the, the bottom line of the story is you ended up closing a deal with the financial institution, SMBC, uh, which is Sumitomo Bank, I guess, yes. in Japan, and that experience led you to win in the financial services market in New York. I've never heard a story like that for a non-Japanese company. It's yeah. unprecedented. Yeah, that's true and unprecedented in a way. But it's not like we planned it, <laughs> really. It's, it was just good timing. Yeah, but still. We were like kids, so we, we were joking. We are like uh, Genghis Khan horde, like the <laughs> golden horde. We spread around with the world, and we, it was a, a big uh, interest from customers around RPA. So many people were interested in talking to us, and we went after the people that we had chemistry with. So we were lucky to get, you know, SMBC, and it's not only the institution per se, but it's the people inside. And also Hasegawa-san that I met uh, just a few months before 
expanding into Japan was, he was instrumental for our presence there. And he's a very non-typical Japanese in, in the way he approaches things. He's very open, he's candid. He spent, he also, he was CIO of major banks. He spent, you know, like four or five years in New York. He's very international. And we clicked very well and then he made the connections. So first of all, the SNBC trusted him. He trusted me and Yamamoto-san, after we met a few times, started to trust us as a company. And really, in the beginning, we never asked them for money. So I think in the first six months or so, they just used the, you know, kind of uh, all our services, all our software, it was basically free. So it was an intense focus, but it paid off very handsomely in just one year after that. An interesting lesson you give without the expectation necessarily of anything return because you, it feels right and then you learn and take those learnings and then you scale the company. But it sounds like you were just having fun coding with your friends <laughs> early on. Was it ever your intention to build a big company? No, no, honestly. <laughs> it, I, I, my intention was to kind of uh, find uh, my freedom in, uh, I was very lucky nobody came to me 10 years ago and said, Daniel, take like one, two million dollars for this company. I would have said yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't. So yeah, I'm glad I did. The Cube is glad you didn't I'm too. glad nobody came. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want to get into the, the product a little bit. Going from studio to orchestrator to, to, to platform. Explain the importance to our audience of having a platform and how that's fundamentally changed your market opportunity. Look, when I realized how big is the, is the problem that we address, I also realized RPA and UI automation, it's one way to skin the cat. But you also need to have API, because you will call, and our, most of our automations are a mix of API calls and UI automation calls. And then you need to understand documents, because many processes come with some sort of document. They start with the document, or they are document-centric. To put this together, you kind of make a platform. It's not the one product. There are three distinct technologies that you have to make to get. So that was the decision that led us to build a platform. And then we added the discovery piece. And think about process mining. It's not so obvious why it should be part of the platform. But right now, when we work to integrate everything together, process mining is going to be a central technology to see live all the processes in an enterprise. Those that are automated, but also the manual processes, the system processes. I, um, I never thought process mining was a market per se. I, I always thought it was a capability that would enable uh, business value yeah. to be created, but in and of itself, it's important, um, especially when so many processes are being documented manually. I'm, I know I've worked with a lot of financial services companies and they would have big binders of process and a yeah. person who was responsible for documenting them, that's crazy, that, that's changed. But is, is it actually a market or is it just part of the platform? Well, for some companies it is a market, mm -hmm. clearly. But for us it's definitely part of the platform. I think we very rarely uh, sell process mining in itself yeah. as mm -hmm. a separate product. I think the combination of, of mining processes, understanding where there are bottlenecks, and automating them and this, making this cycle over and over again, it's very powerful. I, I, and then, so you, you, you shared a demo today which essentially was, was quite remarkable. It took many of the things that you were just talking about, put them together in a natural language type of interface. And you mentioned semantic automation, something that you talked about several years ago, yeah. I think, but now it's coming to life. Explain what that is, and I have a number of questions around it. Yeah, so, first of all, automations don't, don't really understand what they do. It's, they just do. They just do. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of an aha moment for us. When we say, what if automation can actually understand what they do? They will be much more powerful 
in the sense when they stop working for some reasons, if they understand what they do, actually they can adapt. Hmm. So it's, they become way more like humans, emulating much better humans if they understand what they do. So this is, we started to work on bringing understanding to automations. And the first uh, process that we, we uh, put our eye on was this repetitive copy-paste that people have. If you think on BPO industry, it's, it's a lot of, you know, take a document, copy 10, 20 fields, put them into an Excel spreadsheet, do some changes to the data, and then put it into another. So I thought, we go to the core of the issue with the clipboard there. And it was, an, it was a great kind of work. Before that, we couldn't look at the screen like an application and ask what's on this screen to really understand, to really understand the concepts. It's first name, it's last name, it's address. It's, now we understand. Someone doesn't have to go and code, copy first name, into this field, which rep represent first name. Right now, they just say, take this data, and we look at the data, we understand what, what is the data about, and copy into this screen. And we understand the screen, we understand the meaning of it. So this is why we are capable, at first view, without even coding anything, to match them. And this is actually the foundation technology for our autopilot that we have introduced yesterday in, uh, in the keynote of uh, Graham. I thought it was hilarious in the analyst uh, meeting yesterday, somebody asked you about the name and, and we laughed about it because he said others use co-pilot, autopilot, and <laughs> so yeah. said, your answer was it's marketing, it's yeah. you know, automation pilot. <laughs> yeah, Don't worry about well, it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So or in a car, it, it, yeah. it felt good to all <laughs> right. of us. Yeah, of course yeah. it works. But uh, back to the semantic automation. So you've got all this combination of unstructured data and structured data and, and they're disparate data elements. And yeah. you're making sense of them, making them coherent. Yes. And as, I guess essentially turning them into structured data. Is that correct? And then being yeah, able to- Yeah, I, I think that's a great way of putting it. And, uh, and we have some patents around it. And that's basically exactly how we, we felt when you read the screen and you, you, you understand screens are more structure than most documents in a way. Yeah. So we read the screen, we understand the structure of data, and then we go to an unstructured format and we apply this structure and ask basically, give me the information in this form. This is why it works. Even if you think like with chat GPT, it works very well if I go to a document and say, Give me, give me this type of information. Yep. Give me the account number. Give me if there is a liability or not. But it's important to know what to ask. Right. So we understand what to ask by reading the screens. And, yeah. and you're applying AI to achieve that. I mean, you guys were doing AI you know, for a while. Everybody says that, but it's true. You bought Reinfer Natural Language Processing company before we do, we, we do yeah we yeah. do we do ai for a long time yeah. and communication mining was based on transformers which is the same technology yeah. okay so you're applying ai to solve yes. these problems are you an ai company and just don't want to say it because it's it's kind of ai washing i or? think we kind of uh, been for a long time yeah. <laughs> we have huge investments in document understanding we we've been a specialized AI company, if I want to be more, more precise about it. And now, with the addition of generative AI, we've become a more general AI type of company. So, thinking about the potential of UiPath in the future, um, it seems to me that you have an opportunity, and I'd love your thoughts on this. Actually, let me back up. There's, there's a very few handful of examples. I'm going to throw a crazy one at you. Steve Jobs, Tesla, Elon Musk, and even Larry Ellison. They put together hardware and software in a way. He was the iPhone, right? Um, the, the software car. Yeah. And even Larry Ellison with his you know, integrated systems. I don't know how closely you follow that, but it's yeah. true. They have hardware and software, very tightly integrated. Is there an opportunity 
vision now to have an AI machine where you take your software robots and actually bring it to the physical world. And what struck me is the semantic automation. Yeah. You've got people, places, and things. You've got a digital representation of my business. It's almost like Uber for the enterprise. Is that technically feasible? Is it a crazy idea? What do you think about that? I think we, we, we explored it for some while. It was always a little bit on the back of my mind. For instance, we have a customer in uh, Germany that uh, builds robotic arms. Right. And they use our technology, not to control the arms, more in finance. And, but then I talk to them, what about if we use automation to control the arm? And uh, so it's possible, I think. And uh, I'm not sure it's, it's going to be our focus. But I've seen other customers want to talk to a customer in Dubai. So they operate the largest port there. So they wanted AI to control the joystick that takes containers and put them into the docking areas. It's also possible. And they use kind of a screen and with the joystick. So probably we can train right now using computer vision. But they are far-fetched somehow. We have a lot to work on the business processes. I understand, you have to be focused. Yeah. And you got a lot of work to do there. I just thinking ahead 10, 20 years, I, I think you know, the AI is going to, already can mow my lawn and vacuum my floor and. It already right? happens, it yes. It doesn't do such a great job, but it will. It will, it will do much better and job. And it's going to dramatically change our lives. Yeah. You know, and so, I, I feel like you've got technology that actually could. Yeah, I think you know. I contribute. said uh, I said something in my keynote that people overestimate what you can do in one year, but underestimate. I yeah. think this is we overestimate we can do with AI right now, and I think the expectations people will be will not be fulfilled. But in ten years, I think we will see the iPhone moment of AI. How are you liking the? The, the new role, relatively new role, I mean the more focused role uh, on product with Rob kind of dealing with the go-to-market. How's that working? How are you guys getting along? Do you ever fight? <laughs> no, actually not at all. Maybe it's a little bit concerning for me. Yeah, I was saying. But we've, yeah. ne we've never been <laughs> into a fight and, and he seems to agree on everything very fast. And I think it's, it's really, it's, it's working quite well. When you find the right partner, I think things, things move, move very fast. And it, I think both of us have the space to move at, you know, where we are at best. So I feel really positive in, uh, in our collaboration. I feel kind of happy doing the stuff that I love. Yeah, you seem happy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so. And that's good, and, and Rob's doing a good job. He seems like he's, yeah, yes. he's, he's got doing a, a much set. better job than I could have done ever. He's got the and skill set that, yes. that perhaps complements you know, yours very nicely. Yeah. So the other thing that strikes me about Forward, I've been to a number, I think we've been at every Forward except the first one. Yeah. Sorry we missed that. But, uh, um, well, <laughs> it was a very interesting one in New York. In a, small. In a small, yeah. yeah. It was an avenue for like 400 people, but we had like 700 uh, <laughs> subscribers. So I don't know exactly how we did it with fire regulation. Yeah, the fire marshal must have been stressed out. Yeah, they've been. <laughs> <laughs> but, but everyone I've been to, uh, you, you try to put customer stories first, and everybody says that. <clears throat> you uniquely, and I think you might have done this before, but you, you launched the conference with three customer stories, short ones, yeah. not big, long, drawn out case studies, but just, it was very artistic and dramatic. You know, if you didn't see it, the lights went on, goosh, and you had a customer, tell, and then yeah. goosh, went to another one, and, and, and yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> but I like that style because it says you want to put customers first and tell that story. Most of the content here is customer. I know content. many companies say they put customer first, but it's, the, it's not so easy to live it. Because customers are a lot of time picky, they are demanding that. You need to build the muscle to have the empathy for customer. And for me, it was very hard to build this muscle into our uh, development area of the company. 
I literally had to go and tell them, why do you feel you are smarter than the customer? Are you using the software at home? Are you putting your career in line and you, you don't want to fix a bug that destroy this guy there, destroy their processes? How, how come? Who are you to think that you can prioritize better? So this is how I got to them and they realized that. Look, maybe it's a, and also working with this big Japanese client help. I think they had a little more some kind of respect towards. So they, it uh, came a little bit more natural. Oh, if you could. To not disappoint the Japanese customer. Somehow it was uh, kind of interesting to see people. Some of, some of their culture kind of uh, transpired somehow. And to, people got a little bit more, uh, I think, polite when they talk to Japanese people, yeah, right? It's true. Yeah, because yeah. they're so, so polite in return. But it's like, you know, the saying, if you can make it there, you make it anywhere, the song, you know, Frank Sinatra, New York yeah. City. It's actually, if you can make it in Tokyo, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can make it we, anywhere. We, we prove it right, <laughs> yes. Um, I want to ask you about your aspirations for UiPath. It's, it's so challenging to build a company, multi-billion dollar company, it's intense, things, never go perfectly, right? And so you have to respond and, and address very difficult, you can't control the market. Things happen in the world, geopolitics. What in your mind, how do you envision UiPath in the future? You said we sometimes under, um, we, we, we don't accurately forecast you know, the future, yeah. but we maybe overhype the early part. What in your mind do you want UiPath to be? Do you want it to be one of the next great, great software companies? And, and what do you have to do to achieve that and stay independent? Yeah, I think we are kind of uh, really on the path to stay independent. Because we achieved the size, so we have some kind of velocity. Yeah. And, and we are, even in this market, it's a big price to acquire for someone to acquire UiPath. So it's I'm not seeing happening, honestly. And I don't want No, good. This. It I kills innovation. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna I really wanna stay independent. So I and I enjoy a lot what I am doing. But and I feel that with our touch of customers, with our understanding of business processes, with uh, we are in a really good position to build the next generation foundational models that can become these first maybe digital companions for our customers and then eventually we'll start to orchestrate business processes and do them completely autonomously. As an AI company, we kind of agree that yeah. you're a very specialized AI company. We saw, just in June we were out here, when we covered the Snowflake conference and the Databricks conference. I don't know how closely you follow those companies, but Snowflake bought a company called Neva. I don't know what they paid. Uh, and, but Databricks bought a company uh, called Mosaic ML. The, the print number was, I think... Uh, More than one billion, I think. It was, th it was over three, I think. But, but it was at their lower valuation. So it was really like one and a half, 1.7. And I remember I, I was talking to Frank Slootman about this, and I said, geez, this market's pretty hot. I mean, you guys are paying a lot of money for this. He said, it's the talent. Yeah. The talent is so valuable, it's, it's worth picking these companies up, and there's obviously got to be a strategic fit. My question for you is, how are you able to attract that talent? Do you worry about the lack of talent in, in AI, or do you happen to have that because it's sort of your heritage? Well, I think we have, a, we have really solid talent in AI. And also think about what our uh, acquisition of uh, Reinfer, Reinfer, communication yeah. mine. We really have great talent from uh, a hub, which is UCL in London. Before the hype, by the Before way. Before the hype, for her, yeah. yeah, for sure. And uh, look at we, we solve one of the hardest problem ever. Think about to create AI that can use a computer like a human user. So based just ask that AI do something and you describe that something and that AI will use a computer like an assistant, like, like a human user, I think it's one of the hardest problems out there. 
And people are very interested in helping, in, in working on this problem. Was that, was that NDA? <laughs> what, I pass? Yeah, okay, can we talk about that? I wasn't sure, I stumbled into the meeting, and I wasn't sure if it was, and it's not, is there something well, you guys talk about? We, but we, we are kind of part of, in, we, we play in iPass, but not, not that we, we compete head to head with the established player, like Boomi or Mule. So you're not trying it's to beat not, them. Yeah. No, no, but right. we play already in iPath, in, in the niche that is about using API to automate the process. And it's becoming actually a bigger niche. And iPath, I think at this point, it's a huge category that encompasses many things. But this one API automation that's part of iPaaS, I think we, we have quite a good story there. If it's an independent category, if we try to play in analyst, iPaaS, this is not important for me. Right. For me, what's important is that our customers know when they go to automate a process, UiPuff has world-class RPA, world-class API, world-class AI. This is the message that I want to convey. To me, it's like process mining. It's, a, to, it, it's not a it market is, for you. Exactly, it's not a market. It's a capability that allows you to add more value for your customers, and of course, if the value's there, that'll increase yeah. It's a good way value. of putting it, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, I got to go. Awesome. Uh, okay. Tell me I got to go. Fantastic, don't get up, because yeah. they'll uh, okay. knock this out. Thanks, Thank you Dave. so much. Thanks. Great it to see awesome, you, really. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay, keep it right there. We'll be right back, right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from UiPath, forward six from the MGM in Las Vegas. Right back.